church? How's my mic? Is the mic working now? Not working. Okay. Technical difficulties. Welcome, church. Welcome, visitors. If you're here this morning and expecting Doug Cole to be bringing lessons, he's in Haiti, so you're stuck with me. <laughs> um, he's down there with, there um, we go, now I'm getting my voice. He's down there with his daughter Katie, uh, with Katie Marr, with um, Justin Nancy Smith, uh, Amy Romans. Uh, they're all down there. They're serving the Lord down there. They're taking care of their children. So this morning, There we go. Hey, that's so unfortunate. You can hear me now. <laughs> it turned down a little bit, though. I, I, I kind of project anyway. But uh, anyhow, they're they're down there serving the Lord. And I wanted to talk about a wedding today. And uh, who here has never been to a wedding? Never been to a wedding. Okay, never been to a wedding. There's one. So that means that most all of us have been to a wedding. Okay. Some of the things that go on in today's weddings. Well, first of all, you've got to start with the bride and the groom. Of course, you can't have a wedding without the bride and the groom. So a man meets a woman, they start dating, they fall in love, and then one day he brings a ring over and says, will you make the, me the happiest man of my life and will you be my wife for the rest of my life? And she says, okay, <laughs> run the right track, run the right track. <clears throat> so... Next thing that they got to think about is when. Okay, when are we going to get married? And where are we going to get married? Well, uh, married. There's church weddings, there's backyard weddings, there's wedding facility weddings. Uh, I've presided over four of them, uh, one of them being my son. And uh, it was at a wedding facility, and one was in a backyard. But there's all kinds of venues that you can choose to do that. So, next you've got to pick a minister. Okay, who's going to marry us? And then, how many guests? Okay, certain wedding facilities are kind of small, or if it's backyard, you might not have too many, or then there's big venues like at this building right here, you might have a lot. And what music are we going to have at our wedding? And then what about the reception? You know, afterwards, after we get married, we're going to have everybody over, and how much is that going to cost uh, at, a, at a reception hall? <clears throat> and then you've got to think about the flowers, okay? What are the flowers? The bride's bouquet, the bridesmaid's bouquet, uh, and then the cake, you know? The cake. So we need to get a wedding cake. And then we've got to send out all the invitations, okay, so everybody can uh, RSVP. And then the groom, he has to pick out a tuxedo, along with uh, all of his groomsmen and his uh, best man. And then, of course, the most important thing, the wedding dress, because it's all about the dress, isn't it, ladies? <laughs> uh, and then a honeymoon, if uh, they're going to go on a honeymoon. Now, I got my hair cut last week, and... Uh, the lady who was cutting my hair was going to get married in Menifee in about two weeks. And then they were going to honeymoon in Palm Springs. And they only had a few days and a few dollars to do it, so that's what they chose to do. Now, I do rem remember another wedding. Forty-one years ago, last Monday, my wife and I were married. <laughs> And yes, that is my long hair in there. <laughs> and you know, my wife made me cut it. I cut six inches off of it before the wedding. I used to have it in a ponytail, and I went down to about the bottom of my shoulder blades right here. <laughs> we were married at the Glass Chapel, uh, otherwise, otherwise known as the Wayfarers Chapel in Palos Verdes. And you've probably seen, you can't get a little picture of it, but it's been in some movies too, uh, where they got married the whole upper 
you know, roof, sides, and everything is all glass. And so we got married there, and we had a reception at, I believe it was the Elks Lodge. So all those things went into that wedding, and we're planning. And so all those, and all those things that we do today in marriages and weddings, but really what I want to talk about is another wedding. Now, all the scriptures are going to be up on the board here, up on the, uh, the, so you can see them. But if you'd like to follow along in your Bibles, if you turn to Matthew 25, we can do that. But everything will be up here. I'm going to be referring back to that um, particular passage. <clears throat> so this is the parable of the ten virgins. Now, Jesus taught in parables. And what a parable is, is it's an everyday life story, like a wedding back in the uh, first century. And he puts a spiritual message with it. So we're going to take a look at that and uh, see what he wants to tell us. And if you're over there, uh, Matthew 25, starting in verse 1, At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom! Come out and meet him! Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are gone out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Boom! Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. He replied, truly I tell you, I do, I do not know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. A really great story, and just prior to that, in Matthew 24, he was talking about be ready. You know, watch, because you do not know the day or the hour that our Lord is coming. Now let's take a look at the background of a first century wedding. So we know about today's weddings and what goes on. But let's take a look at a first century wedding and see what went on. So in Jesus' day, marriage generally took place at an early age. Uh, how many teenagers do we have here? I know my grandson's one. How many teenagers? Uh, one there, one there, one there. Okay. Now, watch this. Marriages in Israel were contracted between individuals uh, when they were in their mid-teens. So around 14, 15, 16, your parents <laughs> has picked out a wife for you or a husband for you. Okay? Now, it was customary for the bride to be surrounded by ten bridesmaids or virgins who most likely were her special friends and of the same age as the bride. Now, I want to take a look at that one word, contracted. What that means, a contract is something that one party agrees to do something with the other party, and they both have to agree. Okay, so if you're a teenager, and you're around 14, 15, 16, you may not have the opportunity to pick out who your spouse is, who your bride or your groom is. And it's a contract between the two families. Okay? Now, uh, in that contract... No, I'm sorry, let's take a look at verse 1 first. We'll talk about the contract in a, minute, in a little bit. So verse 1 says, At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now, it says, if you notice one thing... Uh, right after Kingdom of Heaven, it says, will be. So that's future tense. Okay? And it, it will be like. So he's making a comparison of the Kingdom of Heaven. Now, we all know the Kingdom of Heaven as the church. That's us. Uh, and in this particular story, the bridegroom 
is Jesus. And we are the bride of Christ. We are the church. We are the bride of Christ. Can I have an amen with that one? Okay. Now, verse 2. It says, five of them were foolish and five were wise. Now, in this parable, it's not really concerned with the bride, but it's focusing attention on the bride's maids and especially the foolish ones. So this is where um, Jesus is trying to tell his disciples about being wise. So we're going to take a look at both of those. And in, uh, let's talk about the ten virgins for a minute. Uh, the ten teenage girls who took their lamps and went to the bride's home. So they went to the bride's home for the purpose of preparing her to meet the bridegroom. Now the girls were busy adorning her and caring for last minute preparations. And anybody here that's been a bridesmaid or a maid of honor, you know <laughs> that there's a lot, of, a lot of things going on there to get the bride ready. You've got to keep her calm because we don't want a bridezilla on her hands. So you got to keep her calm. you got to help her out with everything. She's nervous. She's you know, uh, freaking out. So she, she needs to be calm. And so the, the bridesmaids are there to help her and take care of her. <clears throat> Let's take a look at verses 3 and 4. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. Now, I dug through some history pages, and this is what lamps looked like in the first century B.C. through the first century A.D. Uh, They were usually clay pots. Uh, They had a wick at the end of it. They had a hole in the top to pour the oil in, which was olive oil. That's what they used. And as you can see there, you can only get so much oil in those little handheld, you know, um, lamps. So if you were going to be any particular amount of time, then you need to take extra oil with you. So the virgins that were the wise ones, they had a clay jug that looks just like this in the first century that they kept the extra oil in. So in case the lamps were getting low or went out, then they would have more oil to put in the lamps to take care of them. So I said a minute ago, we are the bride of Christ. Now, the Apostle Paul, when he wrote a letter to the church in Corinth, he said in 2 Corinthians eleven twelve, he says, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> So we are the bride of Christ, and we are to wait on him. And you can use that word both ways. We, we're waiting for him to come, and then when he does come, we wait on him too. So, <laughs> Now let's take a look at verse 5. It said, The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. Um, the wedding was at night. Most of the weddings that we have today are during the day. This was at night. So they were busy all day long doing things and helping the bride get ready and picking out the, the, you know, putting on the dresses and doing all those things. So they may have been pretty tired. They were waiting and waiting and waiting. So it happened at night. So naturally they might get drowsy and fall asleep, which they did. Now, the problem of setting, uh, settling a dowry may have caused this delay. Now, I remember when I was younger... Uh, they talked about dowries, and uh, my wife got a, a redwood chest full of some of the stuff from her grandmother and, and other relatives, and that was just kind of remembrances. But what a dowry was, and I looked this up on Wikipedia, uh, all over the world, there's different definitions of what the dowries are. You know, the, some dowries may be from the groom's parents to the bride's parents. Other countries might be from the bride's parents to the groom's parents. So that's what's happening uh, today. But this ancient custom, mentioned frequently in the scriptures, uh, consists of giving of gifts by the family of the bridegroom to that of the bride. 
Okay? Now, these gifts could be, uh, they could be many things. In fact, uh, a discussion of the dowry could take considerable time and lead to arguments. <laughs> so, teens, your families, um, the groom's, par- uh, groom's parents would figure out and negotiate with the bride's parents to see what they want to pay the bride price, as it's called. So, it could be anything. It could be sheep and goats. It could be property. It could be grains, food, depending on the, the, you know, the wealth of the parents involved. And it could be many things, so they negotiate back and forth to find out, okay, what do we have to pay <laughs> to have her as our son's bride? Okay, so when everything was signed and the parties were in full agreement, the wedding feast could begin. And the bridegroom could not go to his bride until the bride price was paid and the marriage contract signed. Quite a bit different than weddings today, huh? Uh, I believe today the weddings, uh, the, there's no dowry, but I mean the, the cost of the wedding is shared by all three parties, by the, the bride and the groom, by the bride's parents and the groom's parents. So I think that's the politically correct way to do it today. It could be a lot of different, maybe on the East Coast or back in any country in the world. I mean, it could be a lot of different things that they do. So, so let's take a look, verses 6 through 9. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom. Come out and meet him. Have you heard the phrase, I got a wake-up call? Maybe this is where it came from. You know, hey, wake up. You know, hey, here comes the bridegroom. You're sleeping. Then all of the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who, who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. Yeah, that's a wake-up call, right? <clears throat> so, let's take a look at the virgins again, the wise and the foolish virgins. Now, the wise virgins are like sincere Christians today. They're very wise. They follow what God has commanded us to do. And we do those things. The foolish virgins are like the hypocrites of today. And I'm sure you've met some or know some that uh, say, Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I don't need to go to church. You know? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian. I, I don't know the Bible. I don't need to read it because I'm a good person. And they're professing that they're a Christian and they're going to be okay, but they're foolish because they don't know what God has said to them. Just like the, the wise and the foolish builders in Matthew 24. It says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had a foundation on the rock, on Jesus Christ. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Okay, let's look at verses 10 through 12. It says, But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others came and said, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he replied, Truly, I tell you, I do not know you. Boy, that's another wake-up call. Now, in the first century, if you were late to a wedding, you were not allowed in. That was the customs of that day. And it was considered very rude. Today, if we're late for a wedding, I mean, you know, it's okay, we hit some traffic or whatever, you know. But, but back then, it was considered very rude, so you weren't allowed into a wedding. So, this is, like I said, these, these are things that were common practices back in the first century when Jesus was there. I want to look at Matthew seven twenty-one to 23. And it talks about true and false disciples. 
He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Or, I don't need church. I'm a good person. I don't need to read the Bible. I'm going to heaven. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. So let's look at the wise virgins. The wise virgins have good principles, just like the good soil in Matthew 13 and verse 23. But the seed falling on the good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. As Christians, our heart is the lamp. Grace from God is the oil. Let, so we must let our light shine in places of darkness before mankind in the good works that we do. If we love God and love our neighbors, grace, which comes from God, our oil will never run out. Amen? True Christianity is true wisdom. Sin is folly, but especially the sin of hypocrisy. For those are the greatest fools. If you've ever been called a fool or you know somebody that is a fool, hypocrisy hypocrisy is the greatest fools. It was the folly of the foolish virgins that took no oil with them. They had just enough oil to make a show with. Here I am with a lamp. Okay, I'm here to do this. But not enough if the bridegroom tarried. They have no principle in them. They have a lamp of profession in their hands. Here I am. But do not have in their hearts true Christianity. The the foolish are void of a spiritual life. The Apostle Paul, when he wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, he said, Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may may take hold of the life that is truly life. And Jesus, many times in the Scriptures, he said he he excludes from the kingdom of heaven all those who fail to do the will of God the Father. That's harsh. It's the truth, but that is harsh. Now, the very last verse in this parable, verse 13, he said, Therefore, so because of everything that I just said, everything that I've told you and taught you, watch, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour of his return. Just like Boy Scouts are always ready. Just like police officers that are always ready. Just like that firefighters are always ready. When you go on a trip on a vacation, you prepare, you get yourselves ready, you get ready to do that. So, my question for today is, I'm sorry, and I missed skipped the part, sorry about that. Uh, as the bridegroom in the time and culture of Jesus' day might come at any time during the long hours of the night, so Jesus will come suddenly on the day of his return. So are you prepared? Are you ready for Christ to come? Are you a wise virgin or are you a foolish virgin? If you have never put on Christ in baptism... We have some water right here. Just like Philip when he was talking to the eunuch and he preached Jesus to him, he said, the eunuch said, see, here's water. What is hindering me from being baptized? So if you've been thinking about becoming a Christian and you're ready to do that, 
do it now. Do it now. If you want to become a Christian, come forward, and we'll take care of that for you right now. If there's something that's weighing heavy on your heart and you want to pray with the elders, the elders are standing at the back ready to take you in another room and you can have them pray over you. So if there's any way that we can help you to become a Christian, to have prayers, let us know as we stand and sing the songs and select.